My name is Clancy Immerslund, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm very glad to be here this evening at Sober Stock 3. There's a girl in our group, her or musical organization, led off Woodstock originally. They were the first act at Woodstock. And when I get back, I'm going to tell her that I was at Sober Stock 3. <laughs> I know I'm glad to see everyone here, all the people back in the Half Measures bar sitting back there. <laughs> I really enjoyed our first speaker. I've heard him speak several times. I always enjoy hearing him. He has, a, he has a splendid flair for visual imagery that I enjoy very much, intelligent and perceptive. But there's something I must say. When I was a young man, today, when you were growing up in the Bronx, hey, hey, Dufo, you stole my car. You know, when, I was, when you were growing up in the Bronx, I was already sober in Los Angeles, struggling to become a better person. And in my early years... My, in the 1960s, I worked in radio and television in Hollywood. I was a promotion director for Channel 9 in Hollywood, and I, uh, another guy and I created something called Boss Radio, became the number one hard rock station in the world, and we just all were slick. And everyone around us was Jewish. Everybody was Jewish in the business, it seemed like. Then later on, uh, through a f guy, a sponsor named John Frankenheimer, I got into some movies. There was a bunch of movies surrounded by Jewish people. And Los Angeles has a large a large population of Jewish people, bright, alert, receptive, but Jewish people. And uh, I'm glad, to, I'm, I enjoy really, a, I have what's called a Yiddish Kopf. I, uh, I enjoy working with them. However, I am from up here, and I'm a Lutheran. And I'm so glad that now at last you're here where I'm in the majority. <laughs> Jesus Christ, why don't you get out of here? And I've talked about this. I've, made, I've said this, I think, in Bad Acts, something like this, that, you know, I, I have kind of a reputation for being cynical and kind of slick, and I, I'm not at all. I'm down deep. I'm a, I'm a pussycat. I really am. And I, and I was thinking, just thinking tonight, if, if I had, if the doctor told me I had one day left to live, that almost happened recently, by the way, but if I had, now I, if the doctor told me I had one day left to live, I think if I could, I'd come to here, come to this. I wish this procedure would be going on, and I would like to sit there while John did the raffle for the cowbell. <laughs> no, laugh if you want to. Make that last day seem like forever. But I had to get up. I had to get up at 4:30 this morning to catch a plane out of Los Angeles at 6:30. So I'm really not at the top of my game. I'm kind of soft and gentle, and I uh, and it was kind of a wasn't a bad trip. It just was a Northwest Airlines trip, you know, which you, <laughs> that hideous little thing mosquito you fly from Minneapolis. <laughs> the uh, Stewardess, I guess they don't, they call them flight attendants now, but the stewardess was kind of a, she must have had a hangover. She was sullen and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But it wasn't a bad trip. I'll tell you a bad trip. A while back, I spoke in Reykjavik, Iceland, which is about uh, 2,000 miles beyond any lengths. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the only thing good about it, they're all, they're all descendants of primeval Norwegians. <laughs> And they have a kind of a bastard Norwegian language. And uh, I try to worm, worm my way into their warmth. And on the way back, it's a long trip. You've got to fly air, Iceland air. Yeah, I blotted it out in an effort to stay sane. <laughs> Iceland air to Minneapolis, then take your domestic airline. I did that. And I sat in Minneapolis on Sunday night. I was tired, and God had been a long trip, and I had to wait four hours for a plane to Los Angeles. And I was sitting in the red carpet room, which is the frequent flyer room for United Airlines. And I had to go to the, went to the washroom, a nice little washroom. There, two little stalls side by side, little doors. And I sat in one of them just doing my business and sitting there thinking, it's well, not much longer. And all of a sudden, a voice comes from the other side and says, Hi there. <laughs> I'm not a senator. What is he talking to me about? I'm sorry I said that. I remember one, one time in 1962, a guy I was listening to a guy talking in Los Angeles who was a very vociferous 
opinionated guy. And he got up and said, there are three things we don't talk about. This was during the Kennedy administration, I guess. He says, there are three things we don't talk about today. We don't talk about sex, religion, or politics, because it's such a polarizing thing. We don't talk about those things. But I do want to say a few words about that damn Catholic president screwing those girls. <laughs> but anyway, this voice said, hi there. And I, I just think, I'll just tell with it. I presume the voice said, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> Not that I better quash this now. So. I'm going back to Los Angeles to see my wife and my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. But thank you very much for asking. I thought that should do it, but it didn't. Long pause, the voice said, we could really have some fun tonight if you wanted to. And I was tired and I was a little stressed. I should over, I overreact this. I said, look, I don't know what your problem is. For God's sakes, get off it. I'm not in here to listen to your damn nonsense. Now shut up. There was a long pause, and the voice said, I'll have to call you back. This asshole in the next stall won't shut up. <laughs> That's what we call a bad trip. <laughs> but it's always, I always enjoy listening to you speakers, such as tonight and other speakers who are talking about the program because it's so odd how we come from such diversified places and diversified backgrounds. I, came, I couldn't come from a more opposite one than a big city Jewish family, the small town Norwegian Lutheran family. And I was uh, surrounded by security by, and was raised there and I became a good student. I, I learned to sing little songs in Norwegian and I was confirmed and catechized and and uh, I lived in a very strict structure. I was shoved ahead in school because I could read fast. And my dad was a teacher that everybody respected in town. And I just had a perfect childhood. And uh, same, same rooms, doing the same thing. Who can judge such a thing? I don't want to blame my alcoholism on that good behavior. <laughs> I guess I'll have to. You never hear anybody in get up and say, Hi, I come from a mafia home. So if I came from a good Christian home and shit, what happened? I don't know. You know. In my years, in my thousands of dollar investment in analysis, psychoanalysis, some years later, when I went to see what had happened to me, one of the things that stuck out, and I believe this to be true, too. When I was about 12, I was a straight A student. I was doing well. I was doing fine everywhere. Secure. Felt good. My parents got a divorce. Now, what's the big deal about that? All kinds of parents get divorced. Can you imagine that at the age of 12, I had never heard of a divorce? Nobody in our church ever got divorced. Nobody in our family ever got divorced. Never heard about it. And all of a sudden, here my mother and father separated. Of course, someone explained it to me, and I understood it. But I understood it intellectually, but I felt put upon somehow. And I almost instantly, did, I have a flair for doing the wrong thing, I guess, because it wasn't certainly given to me. I had it all along to almost instantly do the worst thing I could have done. In retrospect, I could see that. I began playing my mother against my father to avoid discipline. My mother gave me hell, I'd run to my father. My father gave me hell, I'd run to my mother. They both gave me hell, I'd run to my grandma. And I fooled him again and again and again and again and again. By the time I was 15, I was flunking out of high school. I had few, if any, friends. I'd become a smart aleck, cynical, nasty little snot. And I was really on the way to some bad end, I'll tell you. And what saved my life is the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And I got interested in war movies. I'd go to war movies. I still have any friends because I was always making smart remarks and cynical remarks. And nobody wanted to be around me much, I guess. But I was in war movies. It suddenly struck me, if I could become a war hero, I would really be something. So I, one day, I told my mother I wanted to go to Superior, Wisconsin, to visit my aunt. She packed my little bag and gave me a bus fare. And a guy gave me a ride to Minneapolis. And I decided to hitchhike to San Francisco to get the war. And I never hitchhiked before. I lived a very secluded life, even. And I, the guy said, well, stand here. So I stood there in my... And the car stops. She says, where are you going, kid? I says, San Francisco. So am I. Hop in. And away we went. 
Turned out he was going back to a ship. He was in the Navy. I don't know why he picked me up, just out of some... He had to be a saint all the way across the country. He bought my meals, and uh, at night there was no motels. He'd stop in a trailer court. He'd get me a bed, and he had listed my prattle. And I didn't think anything about it. I just I never hit, I just thought that's what it is when you hitchhike. You tell them where you're going, they get you there. Who do I know? Yeah. And we, I told him I wanted to be in the Marines and go over there and kill Japs. And he said, well, kid, you're a little small. I was about this big and face full of pimples. And he said, I don't think you have a little, have a little difficulty. The, but I'll tell you what, they're crying for people in the Merchant Marine. I mean, all the good guys that go out in the Navy. And you might be able to get into that. I'll, I'll show you where the Coast Guard office is. And go in there and tell them when we get there, you tell them you're 16, you want to be in the Merchant Marine. And I said, okay. I remember the morning, one of the golden moments of my life. I, I think about it. He dropped me off at the pier in Oakland. It was a fog, kind of foggy. And I smelled the ocean for the first time. And he put me on a ferry going across the Bay to ferry building in Los San Francisco. I remember standing on that thing and just amazed. And all of a sudden, the sun started to come up and the fog lifted. There was San Francisco, the spires coming out of the fog. Oh, God, I, I smell the sea. And I got to the ferry building and he said, give me an address on Market Street. And I walked up there with my little bag and I went in and said, I want to be in the Merchant Marine. <laughs> Man says, okay, fill out this application, kid. I put down 16, as he told me. Well, you're only 16, kid. We have to have your parents' permission. So I took it around the block, got my parents' permission. And they were so desperate at that time, they issued me Siemens papers right there. Temporary ones, followed them up with permanent ones. Took another guy and I down to the, turned out to be Montgomery Street, I didn't know what it was, to the Union Hall, and we had to sign a waiver for dues, what the hell that is. Took us to the Embarcadero, put us on a ship. That afternoon, we were on a load of torpedo warheads going to the South Pacific. And it really was fun for about an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's where the World's Fair was last year. That's Alcatraz. That's the Golden Gate Bridge. After that, there's just nothing ever. <laughs> And they stuck me in a room. They called it a cabin. People around here in Minnesota know what a cabin is. It's got logs in it. This is just a room with three of the worst type of people that any small, skinny, pimply-faced Norwegian Lutheran kid can be with. And these people are called men. <laughs> what the hell are you supposed to be? I could see there's a little tension in the room. I told him a joke that I was used to go over good in study hall. Didn't go over there. So, Why'd you get your damn bunk there? You got that one? Shut up. <laughs> I still vaguely remember that bunk, and the ship was moving around. It was hot in there. And these guys start talking. And, uh, oh my God, I felt bad because I was a sinner. And I, I don't want to be a sinner. I don't... But I seem to need more fun than other Lutherans somehow. And I just... <laughs> but I, every time I sin, I feel guilt. And yet I have such a flair for it. I mean, but I had not remembered to keep the Sabbath day holy several times. And I had not remembered to respect my mother and father and treat them with honor. And I had learned to say some dirty words. But I lay in that bunk and I felt, these guys start talking. And I thought, my God, I'm in a room with some of the worst sinners in the history of the world. <laughs> These guys had been in San Francisco for three or four days with the ship, and they'd done dirty thing after dirty thing after... I mean, I'd, even at the age of 15 in Eau Claire, I'd had sex. But I'd been apprehensive, and I'd been afraid, and I'd been alone. And these guys were doing it... These guys were doing it with people. I couldn't believe it. And I suddenly realized, of course, they've all got black hair. Those are the Catholics I've heard about. <laughs> but it was kind of a difficult start. And, uh, but in a while, a little short time, I, be I finally had a job after a couple of days on the ship. I became the ship fool. You know. <laughs> hey, kid, get out of the engine room. Tell me we need a left-handed wrench. <laughs> hey, kid, go up on the bridge. Tell the captain we need some elbow grease. And these guys who drank every day, and they drank whiskey. They weren't supposed to have it on the ship, but who's going to stop me? Oh, these were really 
any other era, they'd have been pirates, you know. Ha, 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 ha. I'd have walked the plank, I suppose. But they'd drink whiskey after the watch. They all had whiskey in their sea bags. And I was just shocked. To the best of my knowledge, I'd never been in the same room with a bottle of whiskey up till that time. Lutherans, Norwegian Lutherans, don't do that. And one day, one of these boobs turned to me and says, How about you, Junior? You think you're man enough for a little snort? He shoved that bottle in my face, and I decided to get that settled right then, once and for all. I was going to tell him, You get that bottle out of my face. You may not know this, but I'm a Norwegian Lutheran. And I'm on to what you people do. I've heard about you. And I don't drink whiskey. And my mother and grandmother promised that I never would drink whiskey. And I'm, I don't want to be like that. Keep that whiskey out of my face. I was going to, going to tell him that. Just demolish him. And I was just preparing it. He said, why do you think you're mad enough? I heard a voice say, God damn right. <laughs> So I had my first drink of whiskey out of the first glove but I ever saw it and burned my mouth and my throat and my stomach and my throat and my mouth and his shirt finally. I <laughs> get the bottle away of the next year. To this day I don't know a worse emotion, a worse feeling than public humiliation, embarrassment where someone just makes you look like a nothing and there's nothing you can do about it. I wanted to just hit these guys as they laughed. Ha, 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 you know. <laughs> I thought later there's something I could have done. I'm glad I didn't think of it. It would have thrown me overboard, but it would have been cute. Oh. Said, Lean over, you. Yeah. Take that. Just give, <laughs> give, one, give one in the old eye. But all the way across the central Pacific when nobody was around, every at least once a day I'd sneak in one of these guys' sea bag and take a drink of whiskey. And I'd throw it up and I'd have to wipe it up so they didn't know. But I was so desperate because I had this delusion that the reason they thought I was a non-human, non-man because I threw up that whiskey. The reason they thought I was a non-man because I was a non-man, you know. But uh, we're coming into Pearl Harbor. They're digging up ships all around us. Very exciting. I'm down there the night before my 16th birthday taking a drink of that crap. And I stayed down. Then I couldn't breathe. <laughs> then somewhere along there, suddenly, I felt significantly different. I felt significantly better. <sighs> now, I don't really remember this at all. A guy gave me a tape of a talk I gave when I was three years sober. And I remembered it then, and I'm now quoting that tape. I can hardly remember where my hotel is, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that I had a great reaction to it. And one of the problems in my life, it always seemed to be, is that for one reason or another, I always felt different when I was a kid. I mean, although I did well, I always felt I didn't quite fit in. It's almost as though there was something missing in me. I didn't know what it was, but at a distance I could get along with a lot of people but up close it's almost as they look disappointed in me there's there's something about me that I don't grow on you somehow I don't fit in very well and I thought well, it's like if you're going around and you're supposed to feel like this to feel like this a lot and when I, I figured when I grow up it'll be all different it wasn't different but I know one thing that day I suppose in looking back although I never would have guessed it at the time Drinking, have the drink of whiskey made the scale go away. First time in my life. And I felt like men looked. I never realized that then either. I mean, I, I had no knowledge at all. Dumber than hell. Because <laughs> I feel better. But in retrospect, I can see what that does for me. And it was wonderful. And I, I didn't become a terrible alcoholic. I learned to smoke on that ship. You know, we talked about, uh, talked about, well, about smoke at night. You can't. We don't want you to smoke in the building or outside the building or anywhere else. Jesus. Well, I never, I never, nobody in my family smoked, but I smoked and puked and smoked and puked. One day I smoked and didn't puke, and I smoked two and a half or three packs a day every day for the next 40 some years. And I, uh, I love smoking. And I would be smoking now if, uh, but, now here's a sad story. <laughs> In 1985, at the International Convention in Montreal, 
I was in charge of the field flag ceremony where countless nations moved in and had an intricate ballet where they marched and dipped their flag. Guys, it was so beautiful. And they said dummies couldn't do it. And if one guy from Poland almost killed him. He's just stupid. <laughs> I didn't judge him. I just wanted to kill him. <laughs> but we were rehearsing in this big stadium before, and they had no PA system. And I had to scream my instructions at him. And I blew out my voice. And it got very hoarse. I got back to Los Angeles, and it never got better again. So I had to go to a doctor, and he said, well, he said, you've blown out your, uh, you got a really a growth on the bottom of your vocal cords. It may be very, very dense, dangerous for you. I'm going to have to operate almost immediately. And they went and took me in, operated, took out a third of my vocal cords. And uh, my voice used to be clear and nice, not it's crazy. And uh, I think about that because for five years, my doctor had been saying to me, for you to smoke is to die. Yes, I know it. I'm going to quit, Doc. I really am. The doctor said to me, you know, smoking didn't cause this problem with your vocal cords. But if you smoke and irritate that, you could go mute. Ah! <laughs> Never smoked again after that. <laughs> but one of the great problems in smoking, and I... The, it's, a, it's getting really bad for smokers. You know, wherever you go in any country, in the city in the country, maybe it's in, even in Aberdeen, you drive down the street on rainy nights and there's people outside. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the businesses in the daytime, outside. <laughs> and not only that, but people think they have the right to come up to you and denounce you for smoking. Strangers, you know. Why do you smoke? Don't you know the harm secondhand smoke does for people? They, just, they were doing that when I was smoking. I, it took me five years to think of an answer. <laughs> then I thought of an answer that I had to quit smoking. So I'm going to bring it to you smokers here tonight. There isn't an AA meeting in the world where you'd get this kind of information. <laughs> the next time someone comes up and says, Why do you smoke? Here's what you say. Why do I smoke? I have a feeling that one of these days they'll find a market for phlegm and I'll be rich. <laughs> they never ask you again. And I, I learned drinking and smoking. I didn't become a terrible alcoholic. They took me into Honolulu the next day and got me three bottles of beer. They made me tipsy and made me feel good. And It's just something you learn. As you grow up, you learn things. You learn things that make you like and things you don't like. And I learned that drinking makes me feel good. And sometimes if I drink too much, it makes me sick. And... And I went on later on in the war. When I got old enough, I went in the Navy. At the end of the war, I was in the Naval Hospital in Northern California, and they passed around some tests. And uh, I've always been good on tests because I read a lot. And I, I took a test, and nice thing, I thought. I thought it was very cute, but it really did me a lot of harm over the years because for some reason, it happened to just fit what I've read or something. And I got a very, very high grade, like 99th percentile, the highest 1% of test takers in the United States Navy. And I wasn't that smart. And I wasn't that socially aware, but I did it. So I, get, I got a high school diploma out of that from the Armed Forces Institute. And from then on, I carried, if it takes these boobs all of their time, it takes, I can get by on 50% or whatever I can get by with. But I went back to Wisconsin and went to college after the war and got married in college, went out in the world. I won some trophies for the University of Wisconsin. And I went out in the world and became a sports writer, which to this day is my favorite job I ever had in the world, because uh, I like it. And uh, I got married in college to so this girl with flashing black eyes and black hair and just so mysterious, something you never see in the Lutheran church. <laughs> and uh, she told me she was a Catholic. And I thought, oh. But I thought maybe I could overcome that somehow. And, and after I got working... She began manifesting the terrible behavior patterns of Catholics that I never knew about and I never knew a Lutheran boy that did know about. But if you marry a good Catholic girl, Olaf, <laughs> you're about to have a big family. <laughs> and she began turning out children with monotonous regularity. <laughs> I began, a, that was my second career, a national distributor of small Catholics. <laughs> So I had to get better jobs, and uh, I got into advertising and public relations. 
All these years I drank, and I really enjoyed drinking, because drinking breaks down the walls inside of me. It makes me feel the way men look, although I didn't think of it that way. I just thought it was something that made me feel good. And I smoked and drank race hell, and we're a World War II veteran on top of it. Just, ha, ha, ha. It was just great. I'll tell you, if you're kind of new tonight, we'll have a bunch of new people. I want to tell you something shocking. Alcohol is the best friend I ever had. I never had a better friend than alcohol. Friends come and go. Lovers come and go. Jobs come and go. Cities come and go. But when a few drinks is just... <sighs> and everything is all right. That's, you could do that anywhere in the world. Not even realize that it's something unusual. It's just... <sighs> I've often thought about that sometimes. Sometimes we wonder if people are alcoholics. Or you maybe have a friend, you wonder if they're an alcoholic. Here's a test I've created to help you. Get them to stay sober a week, and then give them a big drink. Now here, drink this. And if they say, <laughs> You're in trouble, Jack. But an alcohol is the best friend I ever had. The only problem I ever had, I have a tendency sometimes to drink a little too much. Or as my psychiatrist pointed out later, I have many times been thoughtlessly overserved. <laughs> In addition to being confined psychologically by the Norwegian Lutheran Church. In addition to being being raised during the Depression. Didn't even know there was a depression. But once he explained it, I could see how it had scarred me. <laughs> I had a lot of things. And uh, sometimes I drink too much, and then I act bizarrely. The psychiatrist says, that's because you've been so repressed, you're breaking loose for the first time. Sounded right to me, but I tried to convince several arresting officers of that. They had a ship. <laughs> so somebody said, why don't you go to this new thing in town called AA? Some of the old town drunks are getting sober. They're not staying sober, but at least they're cutting down. <laughs> so I went to my first AA meeting, went, went to a room, seven or eight fat guys sitting around a table. And I said, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> well, it was like being back on the ship again. You know? I, know, I now know why. Because I was 22 and looked 22. And in that state of Wisconsin, there wasn't anybody less than 40 in AA at that time. You know, just like somebody 12 coming in now and say, I think I'm an alcoholic. Do you? I think you got a broken nose. <laughs> you know. I said, well, I, some people suggested I come here. He said, do you think you're an alcoholic? <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, what the hell do you think's wrong with you? No, I try to be honest. With you. I think I'm a little too sensitive. <laughs> Listen to this, Earl. Well, I never said that again for a long time. I'll tell you. <laughs> but I went to A for a while. New people here tonight doesn't take long to learn about AA. A is a place where alcoholics go. What are alcoholics? People who drink too much, they become alcoholic. They have a problem. They come to AA and admit they're a problem. Then they return. They return to God and live happily ever after, I guess. And none of that is me. My problem was not really alcohol. My problem was all sorts of things, emotions and feelings and feeling different. And alcohol helps me overcome them. That's why alcohol is so good. It, it seems to... The scale goes away, and I can be something. I can do things I can't do, and I'm sitting so obsessed with myself and so obsessed with my, what I should do next and what's wrong and what I can do about it. Drinking gives me some fluidity, I guess. And I, uh, alcohol, I wish alcohol were my problem, but it isn't. It didn't take me long to uh, discover that alcoholics are people who can't quit drinking. They start, I can quit. I can quit anytime. I quit then and thereafter, for years, I've quit and quit and quit. My problem has never been I can't quit. My problem is, after I'm sober a day or two or three or sometimes a little longer, someone seems to sneak into my bedroom and put an invisible spring in my gut. And the next morning when I get up, they start to tighten it. And it doesn't come out as, I need alcohol. It comes just... A little growing restlessness, just a little irritability, just a little tired of taking this sermon every day from what I used to do, 
Just, a little, just like watching the world slowly turn from technicolor to black and white. And I've tried, I can't tell you how much I've spent and things I've done to beat that. I've gone to psychoanalysis for thousands and thousands of dollars. I've read books, I've done trips, I've done all sorts of things. But I'll tell you how you cut that feeling. You take a couple drinks. That's how you cut it. Hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Except, unfortunately, sometimes I drink too much. Sooner or later. And then they say, see, your problem was alcohol, wasn't it? You have to say, yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> but you just want to shriek, no, it wasn't. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't alcohol. Alcohol has helped me. i got to find some way to control that. It's like modern man. I look back like modern man trying to control atomic energy. And every once in a while, there's a little three-mile island, you know. Got to find a way to avoid that. <laughs> and... Uh, Probably one of the most interesting things in the book, you know, I've read the book. When I first came to A, a guy told me to read the book, and I read it. And I'll tell you what I, my reaction was. This is terribly boring. Some years later, when I came off Skid Row, they had me read the book again. And this time I found it, it was even more boring than I remembered. It's just... You know, I had been busy writing successful advertising and television commercials and take this action and do this thing and blah, 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 and going to the catering truck and cursing at that son of a bitch. And that... <laughs> that <laughs> and what, you're looking for action, eh? Just read and read. If you are thorough at this stage of your development, you know. One of the things I've been reading the book, in retrospect, I never discovered, I never realized my stories in the book. I've read, read it and heard it read and never paid any attention to it. When I was sober a while, one night I was listening to some boob read chapter three, which they do in our area some of the time. Now, you know, when you hear reading, like chapter five, as interesting and valuable it is to us, but when you've heard it read 5,000 times maybe, you don't really hang on every word anymore. <laughs> Rarely have we seen a person, let's see how that thing's going at work. Let's see how this is. Maybe I should make that call. God could and would have sought. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And somewhere or other, I was off my feed that night, so I was listening to chapter three. And much to my surprise, it was my story. If I'd have heard that when I was new and paid any attention, it probably wouldn't pay any attention at all. But I. But those who are new here, you wonder, we say we're all the same. What way are we all the same? Look around you. Different sizes, shapes, colors. There's nothing we have in common. Different backgrounds, different histories. Our first speaker took dope. In my era, we didn't even talk to people who took dope. <laughs> I talk to him now because I've learned to do that, but I... I must say one thing for the speaker, though. I must. I, I, I got to say this. It hurts me to say it, but I've known him for many years, and he was getting a little pudgy. And the sickness he's had has reduced his weight down. He looks. I've never seen him looking better. How could I get a, just a small dose of that sickness? <laughs> but anyway, the uh, but in chapter three, one of the things they say that. What do we have in common? If you're an alcoholic like us, here's one thing. Somewhere along the line, all of us have voluntarily or involuntarily, and certainly without knowing it, accepted the obsession that somehow, someday, I will control and enjoy my drinking. He says the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Just knowing I, I, I can't go without drink, I've got to find a way to do it. And so we continue to fight the term alcoholic because we must sustain our ability to drink. And then we have occasional brief recoveries. We've all had brief recoveries. And you think, that's it. When I eat before I go out, that's it. I'll eat before I go out. And, I will get and line my stomach. And then you eventually you'll just learn. Just, you just puke more. That's about all. You know, <laughs> just bad. Followed always by still worse relapse. Then that del delicate, dainty little phrase in there reaching a stage of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I just think that's how drunk these poor people get. 
That's what that means at all. That's how you feel after you get sober again. And people want explanations from you for your behavior. And there aren't any except to say, leave me alone. And we tried dumb little things like changing from one kind of booze to another. Or drinking beer only. Everybody's tried that, I'm sure. Drinking natural wines. Taking exercise. Reading books. Getting into spiritual movements. <laughs> taking a trip. Not taking a trip. I've tried every one of those things except one. I never tried not taking a trip. I believe when the heat is on, only cowards stay around. <laughs> Move it out. That's why all my children were born in a different state and all have different. Yeah. I never knew there was any, but I always knew my case was different. That's the other thing I think we come here with. I don't, I've never met an alcoholic who came to AA who didn't secretly feel his case was different. And we all have good reasons for it. And at a superficial level, our cases are all different. That's true, but it isn't until you've been here a while and get down a few layers that you realize what we have in common. But I went in and out of AA for the next, every time the heat was on, I went to AA till the heat was off. And this went on for years. And finally, I went down one more time. Instead of bouncing back up, it all went. My family left, my home left. I, they took back my car, Tracy Locke, big advertising agency in the South, and I'd, I was going to make my big comeback, and I cost them a big account, and uh, I was in deep trouble, and I had to get out of t Dallas quick, and the guy said, will you drive my car to Los Angeles for me? I said, sure, I will. And I drove it as far as Phoenix and got drunk and lost it. Never did find it. All my clothes, everything, my ID is in there. Got terribly upset about that, and I drunk that night looking around the streets of couldn't find somebody. He said, you better cool down. I said, ah, screw you. Trying to be a cop. And he threw me in jail overnight. <laughs> in the middle of the night, I was very, very sick. And I had to vomit. So I went over to the toilet and vomited. Turned out of somebody's bunk. But he wasn't in it. I mean, just, then I laid down a tile, put my cheek on a tile and slept to sleep. The guy came back from wherever he was, some kind of a trustee. Found his bed full of vomit and a drunken fool. He said, damn you, damn you. And although he didn't mean to do it, but he kicked my front teeth out. That was one of the few mornings I was ever glad I'd been in psychoanalysis. I was almost instantly able to identify his problem. <laughs> I remember thinking, this son of a bitch is overreacting. <laughs> but I didn't want to say anything and make trouble. They let me out the next morning, blood, vomit, torn coat. All of my clothes, all of my ID, all of, everything I had in the world was in that car. And I never have, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you, if you want to be a long-term slipper, as I was, let me give you some advice. I'll tell you how to do it. One thing. If you really get in a bad shape and really look terrible, can't get in anywhere, there's always one place that welcomes you, an AA club. That is the only place in the world where the worse you look, the better they like it. <laughs> Oh, this one's mine, Fred. <laughs> so I, uh, I went and walked over to the A Club and hustled some old lady for a bus fare to Los Angeles. And a couple of days later, I'd, I'd, I'd run across somebody and got it broke again. And what had happened was I had a guy at KFWB, which was a radio station on Hollywood Boulevard, and I'd given him his start. He was now a big star. This. It was a rock and roll station. Now it's a news station. But I called him up and said, Jesus, Ted, I said, I've had a terrible car accident. I knocked, my teeth got knocked out. I'm waiting for a check. Could you help me? He said, oh, yes. Told me how to come out in the bus to Hollywood Boulevard, come up this upstairs and, and see him. And he was shocked when he saw me. Oh, my God. He gave me a lot of money. And he said, well, I just feel so bad. And I went out and I rented a room and got drunk and had fun and wiped the blood off me and Ran out of money after a few days. I called him back and said, Ted, my check hasn't come. Could you help me a little bit more? He said, no, I can't. He said, I called Dallas, and you, you're a bum. Nobody down there's got any time for you anymore. You've burned everybody off, and you make a fool out of me. Don't, don't do it. Oh, Jesus, Ted, I'm so sick. you got to help, please. He said, okay, you come to the back of the station, the alley back of Hollywood Boulevard tonight at 9 o'clock. I'll come out the fire escape. I don't want you to come up to the station, and I don't want to see you again. I said, oh, thanks, Ted. I was out there in the rain, 
He came out of the fire escape and said, Here, now stay away from here. He threw a five dollar bill that fluttered down into a mud puddle. And I crawled out and got it. Thanks, Ted. I thought to myself, I outsmarted him, boy. And a couple of days later, two big guys threw me out of a skid row mission. I said, And stay out of here, you mooch. I tried to play, I'm not a mooch. Three years ago, I was on the faculty of the University of Texas. Ads that I wrote, the L.C. Delmer ads for the Borden Company, were running it very weak in life and time and serving post in New Yorker. I've had my picture in the New York Times for one of my achievements. It was really hard to explain these things in midair. <laughs> <laughs> I stood outside that old damn old mission, the Midnight Mission, fourth corner of 4th and Los Angeles Street, didn't know anybody in town except Ted. My mouth was bleeding again, sick. It felt so bad. I'd know. I had a feeling that I'd, I couldn't identify, but I'm sure there are people in this room who've had it. And I identified not because I had seen people with it. When you get to a point where you suddenly realize there's no friendly direction, it's all equally bad. No one's going to be glad to see you wherever you go. And that is a bad feeling. I thought, I better get to an AA club or I'm going to die. I'm going to die in this street. I said, where's the AA club here, pal? He said, well, there's no AA club around here. Not downtown. You have to walk out to Wilshire and Fairfax. I said, where the hell is that? He said, well, Wilshire doesn't come down this far. You have to walk this hill to Hill Street and cut over to Wilshire and walk west till you come to Fairfax. And on the left-hand side, there's a club. All right. I walked. Off I went. In the rain, I still vaguely remember that walking up Wilshire Boulevard. Turned out to be seven and a half miles. That's a long way to walk when you're sick. My mouth was bleeding. And, and walking up this lovely street full of these big stores and big cars going by and people pointing and laughing and, at me. I got to this stupid club and the same old crap, the same old steps, and the same old wonderful traditions, and turn it over and live and let live and God. And, and, and I... I, I I, I just got to get off the street. If I can just stay off the street till it stops raining, I'll think of something. And I went to this club. I lurked around there all day, and I tried to stay out of sight. And that night there was a meeting. They, had, they served cake before the meeting. I had about four pounds of cake because I could chew that. Mm. <laughs> then they had a meeting on gratitude. I almost puked it up again. Mm. <laughs> then everybody went home except the manager and I. And he's, he says, you have to leave, son. I thought, I'm, I'm going to die if I go out in that rain tonight. So I, I tried to put on my newcomer look that I'd mastered. I'm a newcomer, and I have no place to stay. And it's raining and cold. Uh, can you help me, please? He said, you're lucky. A guy named Joe Quinn left a 49 Merc in the parking lot last summer. Doesn't run, but it's dry. You can sleep in that. I... You want me to sleep in an abandoned car? So, yeah, good deal, huh? Yeah, that's a good deal. Huh? <laughs> and I vaguely remember sleeping in that, my mouth bleeding and hurting. <laughs> Next day I went in the club, it was Sunday morning, I had some cake and they had a spiritual meeting, and I had to get up and leave, because I can't bear to hear talk about God. Isn't that funny? People come here from all directions. So many atheists and agnostics come to AA, and the reason I couldn't stand here about God because I believed in God. And I knew God existed. And I knew I was going to go to hell. Because by this time I'd broken all ten commandments. And in, in almost any church you don't come back from that. And when they talk about God and God's love, and I just, I don't want to hear that. I just don't even think about it. Don't remind it. And I, that's another reason I can't help you. I can't return to God. I wish I could, but I, it's too late for that. And I hung around there. The manager of the club said, you know, during the week you're supposed to belong to this club to come in here. This is not an all-day hangout. But you're such a mess, you probably die if you stay out inside in the rain. So you can come in here, but don't ask anybody for money. None of your smart remarks. You have to go to a meeting every night in the club. I thought, oh, God. Nobody can understand. Sit in these meetings and listen to these half-wits talk about how wonderful they are. Just like Scott was talking about here, the miracles and victories. And I just, my... I've just become president of the world, all this crap, and, and think I wouldn't even, three years ago, I wouldn't even hire you to mow my lawn, you son of a bitch, and I, you treat me like dirt. And I had no idea that would be my sobriety date. Didn't want it to be, had no desire for it to be, ever. I had no desire for it. Stop drinking. You know, the third tradition that we read tonight, 
The only requirement for membership is desire to stop drinking. I don't desire to stop drinking at all. None. I had stopped drinking once, and I had a good reason. I used to go to jail every so often overnight. Not because I'm a big felon, but when I get to a certain stage of drinking, I have a tendency to counsel police officers <laughs> and point out their fascist pig attitudes. So I've been thrown in jail off. And I come out in the morning, I got so I could come out in the morning, take a shower, and go to work, you know, handle it. And I come out one morning sick, and you know, I felt bad, and I, I go to, wanted to get home and quick get cleaned up. And a friend of mine was waiting for me, he said, Oh, you should have stayed home last night. And I said, oh, yeah, I know, I know. But it's just this cop, this son of a bitch, I, you know, he's a bad man, and I, it won't happen again. He said, No, you should have stayed home because your little son died, and we couldn't find you anywhere. And I had a bunch of little girls and a little boy. And I'll tell you, he was the idol of my eye. And that made me feel as bad instantly as I've ever felt in my life. I just couldn't stand it almost. And we went up to Wisconsin. I was working in Texas, buried him, had a funeral for him. And I put my hand in his little casket. Nobody's looked. I said, John Emerson, this will never happen again. I promise you, never again. I'll dedicate this to you. And I went back to Texas and... And I felt very bad for a little while, but I had a couple of drinks that tied me over. Then I thought, I can't do this. And I stopped drinking, and I told everybody to stop drinking. And I came home at night, and my kids and I, every meal, we said a prayer for baby John. And we all, it's like Easter. I mean, somebody had died, but he died for our sins. And we all felt, I think the next three or four weeks, maybe the best three or four weeks of most of my life. Unfortunately, someone snuck into my bedroom one night and put an invisible spring in my gut. And the next day it started. Just a little restlessness. And I got thinking. I know I haven't been the guy, best guy in the world, but I've done pretty good all in all. And this God who I've tried to be nice for has taken my little boy who never committed a sin in his life and killed him to punish me. Well, screw you, son of a bitch! And I was, and that was the end of God for me. But it got worse, the tension got worse. Every person I hated my job and hated that town. My daughters, who I was doing it for, Mary, take your sisters and go to your room. For Christ's sake, be quiet. I'm sorry, we'll play tomorrow. Just hate myself for being like that. I just couldn't do. If I could only have a couple drinks. But when you promise your dead son you can't drink, you don't drink. And one day my wife took the kids to mass, and I pulled the car in the garage and hooked up a hose in the exhaust pipe and turned the motor and went to sleep and died. I just didn't know what to do just beyond belief and a neighbor next door happened to be sitting at his breakfast nook having a cup of coffee saw me go in there and heard the motor run and i didn't come out and he ambled over see if i was okay and he found me dead in the car and they pulled me out and beat on my chest and breathed my mouth and rushed me to the hospital examined me determined i was seriously mentally ill and confined me to the state insane asylum for an indefinite period now that's how i get when i stop drinking that's no goal for me because drinking is not the problem. The problem is somebody getting their handle on it. I've often thought about that. But nothing in my commitment paper said alcoholic at all. It said schizophrenic, paranoid tendencies. I'd like to go back to Texas someday and find that psychiatrist. He must be about 90 now. I could move him around pretty good. You, know. <laughs> I said, you ought to lose your license diagnosing me as some sort of dual personality, you idiot! <laughs> if I could have got my personalities down to two, I'd have been fine. <laughs> My problem has always been this group that gathers in my head when the heat's on. Let's get out of here. I don't think we can. What do you think you're saying about us? I'm not sure yet. Mm. I used to hear people today say things like, I'm not sure the program's enough for me. I may need group therapy. Not me. If I want group therapy, I go for a ride alone in my car. <laughs> That's right. I never thought of that, yeah. That's what's so good about alcohol. Alcohol reduces it to one voice. It may be a bad voice, but it's one voice. Why don't you quit your job and punch him in his face on the way out? Okay. But stopping drinking, really, the thing that prevented me from stopping drinking is that I knew I was not an alcoholic. I could not return to God, and I could certainly turn my life over to God. Some of this other stuff was all right, but that's, that's the basic requirements. And why am I sober now? Because somewhere in those meetings, this first week, I saw a guy that I'd seen in the movies. I thought, a movie star? A movie star? What's the movie star? A rich man. 
I bet he'd like to have a new friend. <laughs> and I moved in an old Bob. He wasn't. Uh, he didn't want to be a new friend. And I, uh, I found out later he wasn't a movie star at all. You know, but I'd seen him in the movies a couple times. And later in the week, I was having a terrible time. People were buying me soft food, the uh, coffee, but nobody was very coming through much. And <laughs> they're a group of fanatics. You know, you got fanatics here in South Dakota too. Nazi, a Nazis and fanatics. So they got in my own group, and I just hate it. They say things like, "Better get a sponsor, boy. Living in that car out there, going to die. <laughs> get a sponsor." Hmm. So here's my chance. I moved in an old Bob, the actor. I said, "Bob, I've always admired your program. Would you be my sponsor?" I said, sure, but I want you to do what I tell you. Oh, sure, Bob. <laughs> so I say, he, he wasn't a big star at all. He'd been in three movies, and I saw two of them. So I thought he was a star, but he wasn't. But he wasn't. They said he wasn't a very good actor, but he was, because he could act nicely at meetings. And that took a lot of acting for him, because he turned out to be a right-wing fascist AA pig of the worst sort. Just, do this, do this. <laughs> I thought, why am I taking this crap from this guy? Because he was the only meal ticket I could see out of there. I found out later he didn't like me. And I don't blame him. I don't want to brag. But I was the worst type of newcomer there is in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I know that because I've sponsored a couple of guys like that. And it just makes you crazy. When they come in the room and say, hi, you just wish you had a rifle. Here's hi. <laughs> Boom. I'll tell you what kind of a person that is. It's a person who's been around AA a long time, year after year, and knows all about it, and gets drunk every so often, and comes back and wants attention, and hustles the new girls, and goes out and gets drunk, and came, this goes on and on. You can't tell her anything. They already know everything. It's just maddening. But Bob tried to help me, and he would talk to me sometimes. He'd take me a couple times to a meeting. But I had told him, Bob, you know, I'm not really an alcoholic. I want you to know that going in, I'm going to try to do the right thing, but I'm not an alcoholic. We had the Brentwood meeting. He took me at the Brentwood, very fancy meeting out in Brentwood. And I had to disguise it. I wouldn't want him to think that I knew I was smarter than he was, because then he, I might lose him. So I'd always pretend to listen. It was nonsense. But one night, without Brentwood, he said something that was the, even dumber than he usually said. He's talking to somebody, maybe me, maybe somebody else. I don't know. He said, as long as you think your problem is alcohol, you're going to die drunk. Oh, Jesus, Bob. Now I'm the way home. I said, why do you say things like that? You make me look bad. Yeah. That's what this program is about. I'm not an alcoholic, but these people are like, their problem is alcohol. They need help. He said, their problem isn't alcohol. If their problem is alcohol, they shouldn't even be in AA. I oh, Bob. Light's kind of hot out there in the set today, were they? <laughs> I could always make him crazy in about two minutes if I wanted to. <laughs> and he gave me a long talk, then and thereafter, most of which I was able to blot out. But someone got through it, and it really has been a cornerstone in my life ever since, although I didn't know it at the time, had no idea. He said, kid, the problem is not alcohol. If the problem is alcohol, there's a way to beat it. I said, what's that, Bob? He says, you quit drinking and you clean up your act. I said, that doesn't work, Bob. I've tried that a thousand times. He said, that's right. That's because your problem isn't alcohol. You got something, apparently, like me, it sounds like alcohol is the alcohol. And what could that be, Bob? He says, it's something called alcoholism. Oh, Jesus, Bob. Don't play word games with me. I look terrible, but I'm smart. Look, alcohol, alcoholism, hooray, I'm cured, I'm cured. Shut up, he explained. He said, there's a big difference here, kid. You overcome alcohol by stopping drinking. In this strange thing called alcoholism, which unfortunately for you and me looks almost exactly the same to the naked eye, this mind-consuming, perception-distorting, bodily-eroding thing called alcoholism, you'll discover sooner or later that stopping drinking and cleaning up your act has no significant long-term effect on your life other than to gradually make it so painful you can't stand it. I said, Jesus, Bob. I never heard anybody say that before. They all say, stop drinking, it's going to be better. I said, nah. For people like us, stop and drink, it makes it worse. I said, my God, Bob. 
then why do these alcoholics drink when they notice it eats them up? He said, they're not drinking because it eats them up, kid. You don't seem to know much. He said, you've been around all these years, you don't know much. He said, you understand that an alcoholic is a person who gets an unnatural reaction to alcohol? Yes, I know about that. It sets up a phenomenon of craving, and they can't stop, and they drink forever and ever. He said, no, that's podium talk. (laughs) The unnatural effect on alcohol, he had a Coke in his hands, is something entirely different. He said, when I have a couple of drinks, it almost instantly alters my perception of reality. When I have a few drinks, it almost instantly changes my relationship to the world around me. (laughs) When I have a few drinks, it almost instantly makes me taller and more self-contained and them smaller and less threatening. I said, Jesus, Bob, what's wrong with that? He said, because it is not really happening, you moron. (laughs) He said, you'll drink, but you continue to drink, and maybe a phenomenal craving, whatever it is, but you're going to drink until you have to get sober again. I said, huh. Well, if that's the case, Bob, now these people know it's doing bad things to them. Why would they drink now? He said, that's the other part of it. You don't seem to understand much, kid. He said, "People, people are born and grow up, there's a lot you have to learn to be a kid or a young person growing up. You have to learn the kind of problems you got to deal with and conflicts you got to deal with. You got to learn. You got to give to get. Sometimes, some days you just eat a crap sandwich and swallow it and keep going, and all sorts of things. So that, he says that procedure is called maturing. If you become a mature individual and learn these lessons, you can live pretty comfortably. You can hold a job, get along with your co-employees if you want to. Get along with your kids, get along with the neighbors, go on square vacations and enjoy them. He says, but this never, almost never happens to alcoholics. I said, why not, Bob? He said, we've discovered along the line, when we have a meaningful problem we have to find a solution for or a conflict, we don't have to find a solution. I can drink it away. Here's to you, household finance. <laughs> Here's to you, bitch. I never liked you anyway. Hey, Mr. Carlson, take your job and shove it up your nose. <laughs> and it really works. But there's one thing I don't know. It sets up a little caboose that follows me everywhere, full of unresolved childish emotions. And when the day comes, as it does come for most of us, I'm going to straighten out. I'm going to do this right. I'm not going to go all this drinking and get in trouble anymore. I'm going to do this for... And never once know it's impossible for me. Because no matter how hard my determination is, eventually someone will trigger those emotions. Someone will hurt my feelings. Someone will put me down. Someone will make me feel bad, and that starts the emotions. When I was a young man, I'd go above those people and punch them and quit the job. But when you got a family, you can't do that anymore. So you receive, they little, you watch the pressure build. Try to get away to get rid of that son of a bitch, or how can I get even with him? And so on. And why don't they just leave me alone? It gets pretty bad sometimes. Sci- scientists say that people like us get to a point where you literally must drink to preserve your sanity. And so I always drink eventually. Then it all goes to hell again. I don't, why did you drink? I don't know. Just leave me alone. And he said, that's why people always, alcoholics of our night, we don't, we don't do reality. We drink till we have to get sober. Then stay sober till we have to drink. Then drink till we have to stay sober. Whatever they like the period on either side of the equation. I said, Jesus, Bob, I never heard anybody talk about that before. That's the story of my life. In the last few years, I really had some big jobs. I really did well sometimes. But I always blew up emotionally or somebody didn't make me feel that many. It's just terrible. Bob, I, I got a drink to stand it. He said, there's a name for people like you. I thought, uh-oh. What could it be, Bob? He said, you're an alcoholic. I said, my God. If that's what an alcoholic is, that's what I am. 
I can't believe it. It's not what I thought an alcoholic was. That was in December of 1958, a long time ago. I was sober about six weeks, and I came to believe I was an alcoholic, much to my surprise. And to save my bacon, my life didn't get better. I still, he insisted I get jobs, I get fired off, because I still had a smart mouth and had no emotional stability. But one thing, I knew I wasn't insane. I always secretly thought, I'm insane. I knew there's a name for it. I'm an alcoholic. That's it. How good. And I went to a meeting every night for years. I didn't know any better what to do. And little by little got better. After a while, Bob told me to do some things that I thought were really stupid, but I tried to do them and they worked out. And I, something happened about a few months sober that changed my life. I, I didn't even realize it for years looking back, but I hope it's happened to people here. I began to get the feeling I began to get the sense that Bob knew how I felt, which doesn't seem like much, does it? But I had never known anybody that I believed knew how I felt. My dad didn't. My doctor didn't. My psychiatrist, they all said they did. We know how you feel. No, you don't know how I feel. And he, he knew how I felt. And what's so good about that? I'll tell you what's so good about that is because people like us are magnets for advice from everybody that we know. Here's what you ought to do. Have you tried this? Have you had this debate? <laughs> Passersby, think you ought to go to rehab. <laughs> but if you can find somebody that you believe knows how you feel, that advice becomes meaningful information. I remember standing again one other night at the Brentwood meeting, one of the few times I was there, just a few blocks from where O.J. Simpson didn't kill his wife later. <laughs> And we're standing there, and he says, see that woman over there? I yes, I fear a beast. So I want you to apologize to her. Why should I? Someone told me the Monday night meeting at the club, you called her a bitch. She is a bitch. <laughs> Why do you think she's a bitch? She told her new girl to stay away from me. <laughs> well, she's right. You apologize. I can't think of a person in the world told me that at that moment. I would have said, not said, to hell with you. I'm not going to abase myself before that woman. She doesn't like me, and she talks about me all the time. She's a nasty, gossipy, nasty old bag, and she tries to get rid of me, and I say, hell with her. But somebody that I believed knew how I felt told me to do that, and I found myself going, <laughs> you bitch. <laughs> But he got me from then on to get, got, found me ways not to quit jobs and, not, and to, to get along little by little. A long, terrible process. But I, I finally held a job in my first year, at the end of my first birthday, for almost four months before I got fired. My second year, I got a little job as a beginning job and a beginning writer in a medical corporation. And I determined to make my move, boy. Some guy took me out of the thrift shop, got me a couple of suits. Had no front teeth yet, but I learned to carry my lip like this. <laughs> they just thought it had been burned in a fire. <laughs> and I just, I'm going to make my move now. This, I'm going to be something. And uh, I worked, worked there about four, first four days. And I said, well, I'm going to do this. And you know what happened? Somebody hurt my feelings. I heard somebody say, that guy has no front teeth. <laughs> I thought, for Christ's sake. What kind of people? Can't you just let me at least make it do something right? And I thought about that guy. By the end of the day, I was ready to go over and punch him and quit. I was ready to go. I just, there's no way I could ever be anything again. I, the only thing that kept me from it, I promised old Bob I'd call him before I quit. I said, Bob, this son of a bitch. He said, here's what you do. Tell him, tell him this kid. I said, I won't work for this guy. He's a malicious, nasty bastard. Try it. So I know that guy and, and, and nicely confronted him. And he said, oh, oh, I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings. I didn't mean to. I admire what you're doing here. He said, I, I just mentioned that you've come from some tough place and you're really making a great move. And, and he became one of my good friends in that company. Probably the next year, must have been 30 or 40 times I had to call Bob because my emotions were right on the edge. But he'd give me some action I would try to do. 
when I was five years old, I was director of advertising. Shut up. <laughs> what time does this meeting leave for Minneapolis? <laughs> when I was, uh, I was director of advertising of that big corporation, had front, front teeth end. He used to smile a lot. If there are any of you new people who have lost teeth, let me give you hope. When you become spiritually pure, they grow back. <laughs> when I was seven years sober, as I mentioned, I was in Hollywood, became boss radio, KHJ television. When I was 10 years sober, I was downtown doing public relations for an oil company. 15 years sober, I was a marketing director in Beverly Hills. When I was five years sober, the same wife and all those children heard the crinkle of green in my wallet all the way to Dallas, leaped out of their post office box, rushed to my side. Nine months and ten seconds later, another Catholic hit the street. Somebody gave me a book on the rhythm system then, we ended all that. You know? <laughs> and they're all grown up. Three of my daughters turned three of my daughters turned eighteen this year in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm very pleased with all of them. They don't deserve applause. They're lucky to have a good father. <laughs> and I'm happy to say they got they got sober without any help from me at all. I'm so glad because I because you, parents can't help children. Only you screw them up, seems to me. My other kids are. I have a son. The last child was a son, so I had a son again. I was so pleased. I've been a fan of his when he was a little boy. He and I did a lot of things together. We got high school captain's football team. I flew back from where I was and ran the ten yard chains every week. And and he went off to college, became a computer wizard. And he and a bunch of guys sit in a think tank in Santa Monica and create games. They just finished Spider Man three, and they're doing all these big hot shot games. And he's an alcoholic, and he won't do anything about it. He won't. And he's, you know, 41 now, 42. His wife has left him. He's about to lose his job. He says, I know about AA. I've been around AA. My, my whole house has been full of AAs as long as I've been alive. I don't like these people. And I, I tried to help him. I realized I can't help him. And it makes me crazy because I sponsor people, a lot of people around the world. And I can't help my own son. And I know that because I've spent 30 years explaining to people they can't help their own son. And uh, so I pray for him. And I don't even see him much anymore. I said it was X, Y, we were divorced, separated with I said, Diana, Clancy and I are, were so close. Why, why doesn't he want to see me? He's old. He said he loves you very much. But he never wants to see you when he has alcohol in his breath. And he always has alcohol in his breath. What do you do about that? You keep going. The only one of my children that really ever turned out wrong, one of my, my oldest daughter, She's one of the girls in AA, but uh, she she's become a judge. We so much wanted a defense attorney, but no. <laughs> she came home at Christmas a few years ago. She said, remember, Daddy, when we were little girls, you used to send us to our room and holler at us? I said, yeah, but you understand why now, Mary, your name. She said, of course I understand, Daddy. But when you come to Albuquerque, I'm going to send you to a little room. <laughs> I have no need to go to Albuquerque. <laughs> but very quickly to get, get out of this, when I came to believe I was an alcoholic, that was a change in my life. I, I could, I've said it hundreds of times. I never believed it. And I think, well, alcoholics, you might say if you're new, yeah, you came off skid road, your teeth kicked out. Of course you're an alcoholic. That has nothing to do with it. That's just a fact of life. I sponsor, I sponsor the guy that put the flag on the moon. I sponsor a multi, multi-million dollar industrialist. I sponsor people in the movie industry. I sponsor guys who work on the street, shoveling crap. They all got something in common. What? They weren't all thrown on the midnight mission. They all got to a point where they had to drink to stand reality. And now reality, they can't stand reality and they can't stand drinking. And there you are and you're screwed. But your mind says, but you're not really an alcoholic, you see, because life is so miserable when you're sober, never knowing that that's part of the disease of alcoholism. And it's just it's an interesting thing. As a result of that, my sponsor pointed out, helped me to overcome my problem with God. I told him I couldn't return to God. He says, you don't have to return to God. He says, you got to come to believe in something. Can't you believe in it? Hey, God? And I said, no, I, I believe in it. I'd want to talk about God. He says, can't you believe in AA? I, I, it's all right. I don't like it very well. You know. He says, you think I'm doing better than you are? Said, of course you are. 
said, congratulations, I'm your new higher power. <laughs> and I could accept that because he could not send me to hell. He would, uh, but I could believe that, and I tried to do things he said. And as a result of taking actions over a period of time, by the time he died, I believed in AA as my higher power. And I got another sponsor, a very spiritual man, but he never told me what to do, but he showed me by his example. And one day I found myself praying to God. Because he had pointed out to me that day, he said, Kid, you're not important enough for God to hate. That made me feel better. <laughs> and I prayed to God and over a period of time and taking actions. I came to believe that God didn't hate me. And I came to believe that God loved me as much as you, no more than you, no less than you. And as each of us, I think, very well said by Scott tonight, very well. We all uh, are in this together. And who knows why people get cancer and some people don't. And some people have heart attacks and some don't. I know that there's a pattern. If I follow it, I will feel more at one with myself and with the universe. And I can't do it all the time because I'm a human being and I'm fallible and weak. But I can keep going to it. That's why I keep going to AA, to keep that, what edge I can get. And I know that the third step, which was going to be my final step I couldn't take, turn my life over to God. How do you do that? I rewrote it to say, I'll try to do what Bob says. And I'll tell you, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. So now it's been, next month, it'll be 49 years since I walked off Skid Row. I have, this is the signal for applause. <laughs> because just people at the bar started a love offering and moved the baskets up in the back. But... There's one thing I want to say just for the fun of it. I don't know. I, I know we want to get, get out of here because a lot of us want to hurry and get back home. But I got, probably got several blocks to go. Uh, I don't want to miss getting back to my room and listen to the trains go through. But sometimes new people say, how does it work? How does AA work? How does it work? We have the answer to that right here. How it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail, but that's not what they're saying at all. What they're saying is, why does it work? Why does AA work? And I'm here to tell you, if you're new or if you're not so new, something you may not have known. Nobody knows why it works. Nobody knows why it works. You think, well, how can you do it if you don't know why it works? For a very simple reason. I'll give you a good example. The 1700s. The worst epidemics in the world were smallpox. Nobody knew what you could do about smallpox. You got it, and just like we thought about AIDS, it just wiped out a third of a city. I have a book home called Bring Out Your Dead, about Philadelphia in 1725, going through the streets with wagons. Bring out your dead. You bring out your mother, your baby had just died, and throw them on the wagon. Nobody, no, nobody ever heard of germs, never heard of bacilli, nobody heard of nothing. And it's just an absolute terror. In London, there's a doctor named Dr. Jenner, and he wants so much to help these people, and he devoted his life to it, but he could find no answer because they had no knowledge, of course. But he, after a while, ran across a funny little fact that some girls who milk cows never got smallpox. And yet here's some girls who smoke, smoke milk cows, they got working right with them, and they got smallpox and died. Why would that be? And he talked to each of them. And after a period of time, he came to another little, maybe just by coincidence, they all had had a minor disease that milk, milkers got called cowpox. And people had cowpox, didn't get smallpox. But why would that be? That's silly. So he did one of the classic tests of all time. He bought a little boy named Jimmy Phipps, nine years old. Took him to Wanda where these girls had cowpox. Some of them, he didn't know how to transfer illness. So he, cut a little slash in the kid's arm and took some pus of blood off their eyes and rubbed it in the kid's arm and he got sick, got better. And then he took him to where they were dying of smallpox. And this time he uh, didn't use his hand, he used a stick, cut a little slash, took some blood and pus and rubbed it in the kid's arm. And he got sick and got better. And for the first time ever they knew how to stop smallpox. You get cowpox. What didn't make sense and makes people, what nonsense is that? Interesting thing. 
The name for cow in Latin is vaccus. Vaccination means injection of the cow. And But most people did not accept it. Take one disease and get another one, you're crazy. That's just a coincidence. But the people that took it saved their lives. And about 100 years later, they discovered why. When they had telescopes and, I mean, microscopes and knowledge of things, they could look up and see that somehow or other, the elements of cowpox stopped the virus of smallpox and did not let it go forth. And so it did stop it. To this day, it's a variation of the same thing that keeps us from getting smallpox. And then they knew, it. oh, that's wonderful. But Dr. Jenner was dead, and so most of the people, all the people that fought against it. And I sometimes think that's, the, that's where AA is in a way. You know, why does it work? We don't know. Maybe 100 years from now, some scientists will come lurching out of the laboratory and say, I found the answer. It turns out that when a series of odd actions are taken under the direction of a cruel tyrant, it sets up a reaction in the upper cerebral cortex that makes it unnecessary to drink alcohol or use drugs. Oh, doctor, wonderful. You'll get, the, uh, you'll get the award, you'll get the Nobel Prize. It won't help any of us, we'll all be dead. <laughs> but it's nice to know that some will know. But where we are in AA tonight is this. We want to tell you new people, take the damn cowpox. Take the damn cowpox. Because if you don't, you're a goner. There's no way around it. The last thing I want to say is the purpose of the AA, eventually I went through the steps, made amends, and did these things, and did all the things we talked about. And my pers- it turns out the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is not to make you dry longer and longer. God, I'm almost 49 years dry. I burst into flame up here. <laughs> <You know. laughs> the purpose of AA is to very slowly do what alcohol did fast, to change my perception of reality to change my relation to the world around me, to little by little make me taller and more self-contained and them smaller and less threatening. And sometimes when you do this, it happens in a way you didn't expect. When I was 15 years sober, as I said, I was doing quite well. I was director of marketing for publishing firm in Beverly Hills. And one day, in some bad way, something got in my head. I found myself leaving a job, that job, and for the last 34 years, I've been the managing director of the Midnight Mission on Skid Row, the place that threw me out in 1958. And people say, why in the world would you give up this career for this run of this damn Skid Row place? And there's no good answer to that. Well, it was such a significant decrease in salary, I couldn't pass it up. I'm still trying to find those two bastards that threw me out. Once I get there, I'll be gone. <laughs> Monday morning, I'll do something that none of you will do, I'm sure. I have to live up by the ocean on the west side of L.A., and I'll get my car and go down the Santa Monica Freeway, and my car still wants to get off at Beverly Hills, and I wrestle it back on, down in the middle of the Skid Row, big area of homeless death and destruction, park my car under our building and take a walk around the building and step over the bodies of men, women, and children who are dying on that street from alcoholism and drug addiction and insanity and abandonment. And I'll go into the building, and for the, rest of the day, others such as me will try to find ways. How could we get these poor bastards to admit their problem, to be willing to take actions they refuse to take, to do things that will bring them? We know an answer, and they will not take it. Because we're not a treatment center. We're 10 grades below that. We're trying to keep them alive. And then at night, I'll jump in my car, and I'll go back out by the ocean, and to the best of all my ability, put it behind me. I'll go to an AA meeting and share with people or listen to people share, as, and uh, as I did last night in Los Angeles, went to Friday night men's stag and listen to people talk and just went home feeling wonderful. Now, that isn't anything I would, as, <laughs> as uh, Scott said tonight, he never dreamed of. His dream in the Bronx was not to come and talk in South Dakota. <laughs> well, it wasn't our dream to have you come either, goddammit. 
But here we are, and if you're new, you're just like us. Take the cowpox.